I'm joined this week by Lord Renwick, the author, banker, crossbench, life peer of the House of Lords and a former diplomat who served as British ambassador to South Africa in the time leading up to and after Nelson Mandela's release from prison. Lord Renwick, uh, welcome to Talking Africa. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. You've had a varied and significantly high profile career, which we'll explore in more detail later. First, though, um, let's start with you as a young man. You completed two years national service in the British Army before going on to study history at Cambridge. Um, what impact did that national service have on you and how did it shape you in the years ahead? Well, uh, I was uh, a young officer in the Middle East, in uh, Malta and Libya, and it gave me a sort of desire to travel and see the world. So after I graduated from Cambridge, I went to the Sorbonne University in Paris for, uh, for a couple of years, and then I, I joined the Foreign Service because I wanted to get out and see the world. So, so for you, it was an exciting time. It was an opportunity yeah. as opposed to something that you didn't really want to do. No, of course. It was a wonderful opportunity. Absolutely. And did that in any way inspire you to go and travel more when you grew up, when you, when you left national service? Yes, absolutely. Uh, my first assignment, I was sent off to Africa by the Foreign Office because they didn't know anything about Africa. Africa had been dealt with by the Commonwealth Office and so on, and uh, before that, the Colonial Office. So they sent me as a sort of early victim to try and find out more about this continent they didn't really know. So I went to West Africa, to Dakar, and they, you know, very enlightened. They gave me a Land Rover. They told me to sort of make my way around parts of West Africa, which was, you know, a very good educational experience, learning about how people really lived and the challenges they were facing. Yeah, absolutely. You graduated from Jesus College in 1962, and a year later you entered the British Foreign Service. Um, what attracted you to life as a diplomat? Well, it was, you know, first of all, it, you are working for your country rather than for a company, so that was attractive. Um, uh, I wanted to see, you know, what we could do to sort of help or, or make things better in some of these countries. Um, but I also just wanted to get around and meet a lot of different people and, uh, you know, see, uh, experience different places and different cultures. So you posted initially to Dakar in Senegal for a year. What challenges do you recall facing there? Well, the, the uh, country was an uh, extraordinary place. It, it uh, lived mainly on producing groundnuts, and the president was a uh, French-speaking, very sophisticated, educated French speaker uh, who was an, a, a, a sort of philosopher, and he used to make great long speeches about uh, the works of an obscure philosopher called Théa de Chardin. What the population made of this, I was never able to make out. But he was not a bad man, and it was important to us because the Senegal sur surrounds Gambia, which was a British colony, and obviously if there'd been any kind of conflict over Gambia, we would have had a real problem. Uh, so we were working on making sure that it was a peaceful outcome, that Gambia became independent with no difficulties with its neighbor, which thanks to this you know, enlightened president, it did. And did you find that when you were there, you were welcomed by locals, or were you very much standing out as someone who, you know, was not part of the culture and not part of the furniture? No, you were very much welcomed by locals. I mean, in Africa, you know, it is very easy to get on with people, and you do, you do, you do get a welcome. But it was very striking the contrast between the French-speaking Africa, which I was in, Senegal, and English-speaking Africa. Gambia, and I remember one Gambia saying to me, you know, I will never understand these continentals, he <laughs> said. So that divide still exists between French and English-speaking Africa. Uh, you then moved to the uh, Foreign Office for two years, and you married during this time, but you were on the move soon after to New Delhi for four years, and then back to the Foreign Commonwealth Office as a ministerial private secretary before further postings to Paris and the Cabinet Office. And then you went to Rhodesia for the Department of Foreign um, and Commonwealth Office in 1978. And when you look back, what do you feel you achieved in Rhodesia? Well, um, when I... Uh, I was given responsibility for Rhodesia. I was told that this was a hospital pass. I was, and it was a hopeless case. We'd had nothing but grief from Rhodesia for the previous 14 years. But I was told that you'd better come up with some new ideas. And I was very fortunate because uh, just at that point, the government changed. And Margaret Thatcher became prime minister. So we had to give her a plan for Rhodesia. And what she was expecting was a really wimpy foreign office plan. You know, we mustn't upset the rest of the Commonwealth. We mustn't upset the neighboring African countries. Uh, and we mustn't sort of have anything to do with Bishop Mazarewa, who was by then prime minister installed by Ian Smith. 
so we decided to surprise her and we gave her a, a plan which was absolutely not what she was expecting. We said, look, we're, we get blamed for everything that's happening in Rhodesia now, even though we haven't run the country for the last 40 years. So why don't we just intervene properly, really do something about it, take over the country, you know, organize a ceasefire if we can, organize elections, bring it to independence. So she thought this was, you know, this was a great surprise that we came up with this very, what to her looked like a bold and risky plan, and that's exactly what she liked. She liked bold and risky plans. And, you know, we had a, certain, we had a fair amount of luck along the way because, you know, we, we had to send troops, um, and so did the, the rest of the, the Commonwealth. I mean, Australia and New Zealand made a major contribution troops to supervise the ceasefire. The ceasefire was very fragile. It could have broken down at any moment. Um, but in the end, we managed to organize you know, some proper elections. We had British policemen outside the polling booths and so on. It was quite a sort of amazing sight in the African bush. Uh, the Zimbabweans did vote, uh, and we recognized the outcome of the election. We then helped the new government, led by Robert Mugabe, to install itself. Uh, actually, uh, for many years after that, for about 15 years after that, Mugabe uh, didn't govern too badly. Uh, once his hold on power was threatened, of course, he turned into the kind of monster he is today. But we did help to give Rhodesia you know, a new start, bringing it to independence properly. Great. Well, we're going to take a, a very short break just there. But uh, when we come back, mm. we'll be talking to Lord Renwick about his posting to South Africa as British ambassador under Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in the lead up to and the end of apartheid and the release of Nelson Mandela, of course, from incarceration in 1990. So do please stay with us. Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News as we continue our conversation with my guest this week, Lord Renwick, the author, banker, cross-bench life peer in the House of Lords and the former diplomat who's been discussing his early career prior to his posting as British ambassador to South Africa. Well, let's um, pick up um, where we left off, which was the end of apartheid. You were um, sent to South Africa um, as the British ambassador um, and you... Um, published your latest book, this one, The End of Apartheid, Diary of a Revolution. It was released a few weeks ago. It documents your time as British ambassador to South Africa um, at the end of apartheid and, of course, the, also the historic release of Nelson Mandela. Uh, an amazing period must have been in your life. Just what do you remember? What are your main memories from that time? Well, it was, a, it was an amazing period. I mean, I was sent there by Thatcher because she wanted to, to see us playing a more active role. We had huge investments in South Africa. We had a million citizens in South Africa, yet we didn't seem to have any influence on an extremely tough, nasty uh, apartheid regime led at the time by President P.W. Borta, who was, uh, you know, had been a, a German sympathizer during the war. So uh, I can assure you Thatcher, you know, really just detested him as much as everybody else did. But she didn't agree with the idea of opposing general sanctions against South Africa. We had imposed oil and military and nuclear sanctions, but she didn't want to put huge numbers of black South Africans out of work with no alternative, you know, no alternatives for them at all. So I was sent to turn, uh, you know, if, if we can't do business with Borta, you'd better find a successor like Gorbachev, she said, <laughs> who, we, who we can do business with. Now, again, we had a stroke of luck because after a while um, with P.W. Borta, we made some progress. We did manage to get an agreement on independence or help get an agreement on independence for Namibia, the neighboring territory. But he was never going to release Nelson Mandela. I had many bitter arguments with him about Mandela. Uh, but then he fell ill. And his successor, I would got to know his successor, F.W. de Klerk, before he became president. And I was very impressed by him, a very conservative man, but a very honorable person, practical, sensible. And I was sure that he would make major changes. No one else was. Um, at the time, everyone wanted to ostracize de Klerk, except Margaret Thatcher, actually, who invited him to check us, said, if you do make the changes we're hoping you'll make, we will support you to the hilt. And the clerk, the, the, the night before his speech in Parliament, at which he announced 
the release of Mandela and banning of the ANC, he rang me at midnight and said, you can tell your Prime Minister she will not be disappointed. An amazing and, feeling uh, that must have been, given yeah. the task that you were, you were given when Margaret Thatcher sent you out there. It wasn't mission accomplished, but it must have been a real, I mean, did you get the honour of telling, telling her? Yes, I, I, I immediately contacted number 10. I said he's going to release Mandela tomorrow, you know, he's going to, he's going to make all these huge changes. And we then, she did then stand up and show full support for him, which seems obvious in retrospect, but it wasn't obvious at the time. She was, she was just about the only leader who really pitched in and said, you know, we are now going to make, take positive steps to help South Africa and help De Klerk. <clears throat> Well, let's, let's rewind, sorry if I made just um, a few years back to 1987 when you arrived in South Africa. What yeah. was the country like then? It must have been politically... Well, it was pure repression. I mean, the country, in, you know, several thousand people in detention without trial. The ANC leaders were in jail or in Lusaka in exile. And they, they, the regime had started operating sort of Latin American style death squads too, who were there to take out enemies of the regime. So it was, it was uh, an extremely unpleasant setup led by Bota. Could you see any wave of the country moving forward towards any kind of democracy, or did you think it was just a lost cause? No, I thought it was not a lost cause, because I made it my job to get to know a lot of other very influential Afrikaners, including the head of the, the, the press group, the head of the Bruderbond, the secret society uh, of, for the Afrikaners, the head of the Reformed Church as well, who all turned out to be allies because they were disgusted by the, by the militaristic nature of the regime. So when de Klerk started making changes, they really supported de Klerk and those changes. Well, yeah, as um, you effectively acted hmm. as an intermediary for the British government um, between Mandela, de Klerk and the, um, the chief, the, the founder of um, Inkatha, which broke away the ANC, what was that like and how did that play out? Well, Chief Bertolese is quite a character. Going to see him in, in, in Zululand, I mean, if he was wearing his ceremonial dress, it was a leopard skin <laughs> tunic, uh, lion's teeth around his neck and a battle axe as well. But he was a very intelligent man, actually, and he refused to do a deal with the government until Mandela was released. Now, when Mandela was released, I met him straight away, two or three days after he was released. Uh, he knew uh, via a friend of mine called Helen Sussman, great anti-apartheid campaigner who was one of the only people allowed to visit him in jail. He knew that Thatcher and I had been pressing extremely hard for his release, and she had more influence with the South African government than anyone else did. So when he came out of jail, he said to me, you know, I want uh, all, the, all the help you can give me because we're going to need it, and you do have influence with the South African government. And tell us a bit about hmm. Mandela when he, was, when he was released from jail. Tell us the circumstances surrounding your meeting. I mean, did he come and see you, or did you go and see him? How did it happen? Well, he shook me, shook me by the hand and said, please give my best wishes to your prime minister, to the surprise of everybody there who thought that she was bete noire of the ANC and so on. And I then went to see him in this tiny little house in Soweto. And, you know, the, the difference between the, the miserable surroundings and the quality of the person inside uh, was extraordinary because, as, you know, as everybody knows, he was an extraordinary human being. But as I point out in this book, he also was the wiliest, craftiest, cunningest political operator I've ever known. His whole technique was co-option. He started by co-opting his warder in jail, who ended up acting as his chef and butler. Next was the justice minister, who kept, you know, he won him over, and the justice minister kept asking me to help get him released. Next in line was me. Uh, he, uh, even though I was Thatcher's envoy, as I kept reminding him, he kept saying, no, 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 you're my advisor, and you should join the ANC, <laughs> and so on, and what do you advise? And, you know, he, he genuinely wanted to win over everybody to his side, including Thatcher. So he was worried about, you know, her, would she, how did he get her on his side? So I said, OK, let's have a rehearsal for the meeting. You can be Mandela, and I'll be Thatcher. He thought this was a great idea. So he described his long struggle for human rights. I said, that's fine, Mr. Mandela. We agree with you about all of that. Now stop all this nonsense about nationalizing the mines, I said. So he roared with laughter. And he said, but it was your idea. I mean, it came from Britain, that idea, <laughs> when, I, when I went to jail. And it was fashionable then. And I said, well, it's not fashionable now. Yeah, check the news. <laughs> so then I went to Downing Street to see her before he walked through the door. And I said to her, please remember, you know, he's waited 27 years to tell you his side of the story. This earned me a glare from the, from the clear blue eyes. You mean I mustn't interrupt him, she said. And I said, not please for the, the first half hour. Anyhow. anyhow, she listened to him for well over an hour as he told her 
this entire story and then said, that's fine, Mr. Mandela, but stop much lighting the back to the backs of the mines. He roared with laughter. She couldn't quite understand why, but he knew what was coming. Uh, and he, the, the meeting went on so long, over three hours, that the British press in Downing Street outs, outside uh, started chanting, free Nelson Mandela. Then after the meeting, you know, he, he said what was true about her. She's not a friend of apartheid. She wants to get rid of it just like we do. She has a different view about methods, but she's an enemy of apartheid. You can see it on YouTube if you want. Um, so he then asked us for our help in a lot of uh, different ways. I remember, actually, I took him to his first meal in a restaurant in Johannesburg. Um, you know, this terrorist walked through the door, um, all these mining executives uh, eating their lunch to their astonishment. He went up and greeted every single one of them, knew some by name from his newspaper reading. At the end of the meal, he dived into the kitchen to thank all the you know, cooks who prepared it. By the time he walked out of the door, they were all Mandela supporters. Um, so from those meetings that you had with him, could you really see just why he was such a charismatic figure and why he got such a large following behind him in South Africa? Was it clear to you the kind of techniques that he had, or he just had this, it seems to have this charisma, just on a personal basis, that when you met him, he seemed to show an interest in you, and therefore you were immediately on board with him? Yes, absolutely. I mean, one of, one of his uh, other great successes, of course, was winning over the Queen, actually. The Queen adored Mandela. And when he came to, to London as president, great tri state visit. I had to look after him at, 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 at the interval of the concert in the Albert Hall. And I said to him in the interval, oh, in the second half, Lady Smith, Black Mambazo are going to be playing, and you have to stand up and dance like you do in South Africa. And he said to me, but I'm sitting next to the Queen. I said, never mind, stand up and dance. So he did. He stood up and danced, started dancing, and the Duke of Edinburgh looked sort of sideways like this, but then he thought he'd better stand up and dance, which he did. The Queen looked up to see these two dancing, and she stood up and started doing a sort of jig of her own, and no, no other world leader could have accomplished this. And not only that, he started calling her Elizabeth, as in, Elizabeth, how are the children? Uh, no, 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 no one else on the planet is allowed to call her Elizabeth except the Duke of Edinburgh on a good day. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yeah, he, he has the kind of status and the charisma yeah. to get away with that. Yeah. Um, and it was quite a turnaround, wasn't it? Because um, at one stage, Nelson Mandela, from the British sort of um, authorities' point of view, was viewed as a troublemaker. And so for him to come back and to <laughs> have won everyone over, and obviously things had changed by then, it had been many years, but it didn't seem like he had any enemies here in Britain. No. Well, she, she had doubts about the ANC. You know, she thought it was you know, too many communists in the leadership, um, that they were attacking civilian targets uh, because you know, it was so hard for them to fight the South African army and police and so on. But uh, Thatcher really, really um, you know, was immensely impressed by Mandela. He, he had exactly the same effect on her he did on pretty well everybody else he met. Lord Ronald, I think we're going to take a very quick break. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News. I'm joined this week by Lord Renwick, the author of Banker Crossbench, Life Peer in the House of Lords, and the former diplomat who's been discussing his career and his latest book, The End of Apartheid, Diary of a Revolution, which details his posting as British ambassador to South Africa around the time of Nelson Mandela's release from prison. Um, Lord Renwick, a crossbench peer in the House of Lords. I'm aware that one of the um, key issues um, here uh, was that uh, was that um, close to your heart is defence policy and maintaining a strong military capability in an uncertain world. Um, you support the continuation of the principle for NATO member states to spend at least 2% of uh, gross domestic products on defence. Why mm -hmm. do you think that's so important? Well, we, we, we've been going through a period of very uncertain Western leadership dealing with two really big threats to all of us. One is uh, Islamic State in Iraq, the other is Putin's behavior in Ukraine. So in my opinion, it is absolutely crazy to weaken our defense capability at a time when he has you know, annexed um, about a quarter of Ukraine and where the Americans firmly believe he hasn't finished yet. They're, they're expecting him to try to seize the city of Mariupol and create a kind of land bridge to, to Crimea. I don't know if he'll do that. But what I do know is that the West is not yet very, has not yet shown sufficient strength and determination in resisting that. Now, we're not going to start fighting in Ukraine, but um, you know, he needs to understand that if he does the, take that further step, there should be general sanctions against him, not, you know, at the moment we have 
uh, pinprick sanctions against named individuals who can simply avoid them simply by staying in Russia. Now, you know, the next round of sanctions has got to really hurt, and he needs to be told that in advance. Uh, in terms of uh, Islamic State in, in, in Iraq, that is a military uh, situation. We're not going to put a lot of troops on the ground, and nor are the Americans. But you can't, you know, solve that problem by airstrikes alone. At the end of the day, they're going to have to be forward air controllers, limited numbers of special forces troops there if you want to really resolve that problem with all the Arab allies. So it doesn't make sense to cut defense when the world is getting more dangerous. Well, of course, you mentioned uh, I, I, IS there. Um, Boko Haram in Nigeria recently pledging allegiance um, mm -hmm. to that group. What impact is that likely to have in your estimation in the run-up to elections in Nigeria? Well, you know, the Nigerians are facing a huge problem. I mean, they, they are now getting much better cooperation from the neighbors, Chad and Niger, because this is a, a, a threat to everybody, you know, and the French, good for them, have been really seeking to help, you know, the French-speaking countries in the Sahel deal with this threat. But you can't have, you know, normal lives for everybody, for anyone in northern Nigeria as long as this continues, where, you know, uh, military assaults take place on a regular basis you know, on schools, hospitals, cities, and so on. So it's, in it, and it spreads as far as Somalia, as you well know. Yeah. So Shahab. Um, you've been a, uh, working for the government, representing the government in lots of countries in your time. Um, looking at it now, and uh, ambassadors um, representing the government in countries and representing Britain um, around the world, do you think they still have anywhere near the kind of um, power, authority, influence that you had in your times in the places that we've discussed earlier? Well, in South Africa was a, a, a very unusual situation. So an ambassador doesn't usually find himself in the situation I was in there, where it, indeed we, we did act to some degree as a sort of bridge uh, or facilitator between the ANC and, and, and the government. But the actual negotiations were between them direct, but we did try to help in various ways. So that's an unusual situation. But certainly, you know, Britain has, has, you know, an extremely, at the moment, good economy. As long as we maintain a solid defense capability, we will have influence. And, you know, we'll, we need influence where it counts. And where it counts, most of all, is in Washington, actually, which is where I was after South Africa. And the Americans will only listen to you if they think that you are going to, at the end of the day, contribute in one way or another. If you just withdraw, if you just sort of say, right, we're now going to spend all our money on the National Health Service and virtually nothing on defense, we'll have about as much influence as Belgium. And uh, Lord Remick, you've, you've <coughs> re recently written a new book which you've brought in, The End of Apartheid, Diary of a Revolution. Just talk about, um, talk us through your motives behind that. Why did you write it and uh, what are your thoughts on it now it's completed? Well, I waited a long time to write it because I, I didn't want to print it until I could get access to all the reports I sent from South Africa, all the Downing Street records, of meetings with Thatcher and so on, and all the messages she sent to Bota, de Klerk, and Mandela. And the Foreign Office agreed, you know, this year uh, to, to waive the rest of the 30-year rule. So they let me see all the reports, all the meetings with Thatcher, all the records, even though it's five years, five years ahead. I didn't want to write it at a time when it could be embarrassing to anyone. But this is now part of the historical record, and it is accurate because it is. These are the reports I sent at the time, which is why it takes the form of a diary. And what's the reaction been amongst your peers, people you worked with, people who are obviously um, uh, talked about in that book? What's their re reaction been? Well, to that? I think most people are pleased to have been associated with what was, you know, an extremely exciting period and a successful outcome. Uh, it got, it's gotten very nice reviews in Britain, but more importantly, it's had a very good reaction in South Africa. Lord Renwick, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Very, very kind of you.